Hello there. Uh, this is a uh, video topic uh, in the field of criminal procedure. It connects with, uh, with the course criminal procedure adjudication uh, and the material I'm talking about in this particular presentation uh, links up to chapter one part A in the Miller and Wright text. We talked earlier about the types of cases, how serious does the case have to be, uh, when the state must make counsel available even for indigent defendants, and that turns out to be lots of defendants. Uh, this was the famous Gideon case. Uh, now we're talking about a related topic, and that is at what points along the way, at what points in the process, given that it's a serious enough case, at what point in the process does the state have to uh, make counsel available even for an indigent defendant? So, here we go. The U.S. Supreme Court has said two things about uh, the point in the proceedings when the right to counsel attaches. First, the court has said that the Sixth Amendment right to counsel attaches after the start of what they call an adversary proceeding, or sometimes they say after the start of a criminal prosecution. The second thing that they say is that this right to counsel applies to any critical stage after that point. So there are two buzz sets of buzzwords you have to be aware of here. There's adversary proceeding and there's critical stage. So how do these two components of the constitutional test interact? Uh, well, they're separate requirements and I like to think of it uh, this way. The first requirement, the initiation of adversarial proceedings or the start of the criminal prosecution, Think of that like the starting gun in a track race. Uh, before the gun goes off, before the case has really begun, before it's become adversarial, there is no right to, uh, uh, to state-provided counsel. But once the gun goes off, then you may be eligible for counsel. Secondly, think of this like a hurdles race. So, it's not that counsel is allowed to be there for every single moment after the starting gun goes off. Every time something important happens in the case, counsel has to be there. That's not true. But the court has said if it's a, quote, critical stage, then the lawyer has to be there if that critical stage happens after the start of adversary proceedings. So you could figure that coaching, you know, shouted instructions or what have you, will be allowed at every hurdle in the hurdles race, but not necessarily at every moment along the way after the start starting gun has sounded. So that's how they interact. You've got to have both the starting gun sounding and you have to have hit a hurdle, that is a critical stage after the uh, starting gun sounded. Those are the two, uh, the two pieces. The U.S. Supreme Court applied this uh, two-part constitutional test under the Sixth Amendment in Rothgary versus Gillespie County. Let me, re let me remind you of the story. Uh, Walter Rothgary was arrested in July of 2002. The officer thought that he was a felon in possession of a weapon, but that turned out to be just wrong. It was based on an erroneous record of a felony conviction. So at the trial level, uh, Rothgary goes through an initial uh, Article 15.17 hearing, which is the very first appearance before the magistrate judge. He asks for a lawyer, but the magistrate says, no, if you do that, you're going to have to sit in jail longer. It'll delay setting bail. So Rothgary says, all right, I'll waive counsel for now, but I really want a lawyer as soon as possible. Uh, bail is set. Six months later, the grand jury gets around to his case and indicts him uh, for unlawful possession of firearm by a felon, and so he's rearrested on this uh, reinvigorated charge, and the bail is increased to 15000 Ultimately, a, count, a lawyer is finally appointed for him on the 23rd of uh, January and discovers the faulty record. So the, uh, the DA uh, hears about this. The lawyer passes word along to the DA. You've got a major hole in your case. The DA, of course, uh, dismisses. 
Uh, but then Rothgary's sitting around. Walter says, you know, there's something wrong here. I was just sat in jail for three weeks, and I had this whole thing, you know, this cloud over my head for six months, and it all could have been avoided if you'd just given me a lawyer back in July like I asked instead of waiting around until January. So Rothgary files a Section 1983 civil rights action against the officials in Texas. So what's the outcome in the Supreme Court? Well, the court, uh, by way of, uh, of Justice Souter, who you see pictured here, this is not Walter Rothgary, it's David Souter, uh, considers what actually happens at an Article 1517 hearing in Texas. You, do, you make a probable cause determination looking back over your shoulder to see whether there was enough evidence probable cause to support the original arrest, and here that was based on the officer's affidavit. Also at this hearing, you set bail here, $5,000. And then normally at this hearing, the arrestee is told formally about the accusation against him. So uh, Souter says, given th these are the things that normally happen at this Article 1517 hearing, does a lawyer, does the right to a lawyer attach here? Uh, and the big argument on Texas's side is there's not a prosecutor here. So if you're looking for the start of adversary, adversarial proceedings, where's the adversary? Uh, but the court says even though a prosecutor is not here, there is no prosecutor present, uh, nevertheless the court says this hearing does count as the initiation of criminal proceedings because the state's relationship with the defendant at that point has become solidly adversarial. It's pretty clear what they're going to charge him with. It's pretty clear that they are going to charge him. Uh, and so they, uh, the court says, yeah, we do have the initiation of criminal proceedings. The government has committed itself to prosecution, uh, and uh, we can count on the lawyer adding value here. Now, the justices kind of get into the weeds on this question of exactly what happens in this early uh, hearing, which is kind of amusing since so few of the justices actually had experience in the, uh, in the criminal courts. Uh, Justice Alito uh, in the federal courts at any rate, uh, and at this point, Justice Sotomayor has not joined the court, so, uh, so she uh, brings some prosecutorial experience later on. But at this point, not a lot of experience on the court. But Justice Souter does say that the rule that Texas is proposing here would be impossible to administer. Can't do it because if the only thing you're asking is, is the prosecutor in the room, well, then the prosecutor will just stand outside the room and whisper in the police officer's ear, or more realistically, they'll consult beforehand and then the police officer will carry out the business of the state. So Souter says, if we're going to have a rule along those lines, we're going to have to account for the prosecutor pulling the strings from outside the room, and we'll always be asking about what communications have happened between police and prosecutors. Too hard to get into it. Don't want to go there. We'll just say if you're willing to uh, put a label on these charges and commit the state to going forward, then that's good enough, even with the prosecutor not standing there. Now, Justice Alito, our former prosecutor and a guy who knows his way around a courtroom, uh, says that to the defendant, all right, I'm along for the ride for the first element of the constitutional test. That is, you have, we do have here an initiation of criminal proceedings, but we haven't really decided yet, and we'll let somebody else decide whether or not this was a critical stage. So he's just writing to emphasize that you got to meet both requirements, and it's not clear yet whether an Article 1517 hearing would meet the second requirement of critical stage. Justice Thomas comes at this from a different angle, using different uh, evidence. Uh, he's not interested in a functional analysis of you know, what's actually happening in, happening in the courtroom and whose interests are at stake. He's interested in history, and he wants to know what did the drafters mean by using the words that they used. And he says, if you look at Blackstone and all the other contemporary sources from that day, uh, when you talk, when everybody at that point talks about a prosecution, they're not referring generally to the whole criminal case, they're referring to particular types of starting documents. That would be an indictment or a presentment or an information. If you don't have that, Thomas says, you don't have the start of uh, a criminal 
uh, proceeding in within the meaning of the uh, the Sixth Amendment. Now, this is an area where statutes and rules matter at least as much as the constitutional boundary lines. So if you think of your television viewing or movies that you've seen, you, you, you may remember arrestees saying, you know, once they arrive at the jail, I want my phone call. Where, what's the source of that right to a phone call? Uh, by the way, pictured here is a uh, payphone for those of you who, uh, who have only seen cell phones in your lives. There used to be these things planted on the walls of various public buildings and you would pump change into the slot up here and that uh, the telephone would then you know ring wherever you were uh, calling and you'd get one call so whoever you were calling had better be there. At any rate, what's the legal source of this right to a phone call? Uh, typically it is a statute or a rule of procedure. So an example of one of these uh, rules appears in Alabama, Rule 6.1. Uh, that rule allows counsel, uh, not necessarily appointed counsel, it could be retained counsel, uh, but the defendant has a right to consult in private with an attorney. Not necessarily the right for the state to appoint an attorney, but the defendant has that right to consult an attorney as soon as feasible after a defendant is taken into custody. So you see the, uh, the bold-faced uh, language here. The same more or less is true in Missouri, another rule that you read in your materials under Supreme Court Rule 31.01. .01. Every person arrested and held in custody shall, quote, promptly upon request be allowed to consult with counsel, at least if you've paid for counsel at that point. The, Retained counsel may arrive later under the constitutional rule. Uh, rule federal Rule 44 is also uh, listed here. Uh, takes a, a broad-based uh, view that you have access to counsel from initial appearance, the initial judicial appearance, all the way through uh, appeal. And uh, in the federal system, that's broad access to uh, to uh, provided counsel, state paid counsel. For those of you with special uh, interest in North Carolina, the, uh, the relevant statutes are listed here. I won't talk through them. I'm not going to be adding any value by repeating the words, but you see them listed here. Let me close with a, with a mention of two particular problem areas in applying this collection of statutes and constitutional rules. First of all, uh, bail. Uh, as we'll see later, bail decisions are made at several points along the way early in the process. And one of the big priorities for uh, those who, uh, who are design defense counsel systems uh, is to pr put a lawyer into the case at the, mo at the earliest possible moment for bail purposes. Uh, that tends not to be the practice in state courts, and so there's uh, a lot of a long road ahead on arriving there, if indeed the system is going to arrive there, but bail is a big point of contention. The other one mentioned here on the slide is psychiatric exams, and here we've got courts pointing in both directions. Sometimes they say, yeah, a lawyer has to be there during the psychiatric exam. Some critical things about the case happens. We'll call it a critical stage. Other, uh, other courts say, well, maybe we do have the initiation of criminal proceedings, but what would a lawyer do? You know, you're just going to sit there and you, if you can't imagine how the lawyer's going to add value, you don't have rules of evidence, you don't have objections, then uh, we won't, for purposes of the Sixth Amendment, call it a critical stage. So you have courts pointing in different directions on this psychiatric exam question. Uh, so that's it for, uh, for this topic. Uh, talk to you.